Welcome to the Crown Council Mentor of the Month. This year, our Mentor of the Month presentations will focus on practice fundamentals. Fundamentals are the most essential part of a business. They serve as the groundwork for success and need to be reviewed and re-reviewed no matter where you are in the timeline of your career. Coach Vince Lombardi once said that football is two things. It's blocking and tackling. I don't care about formations or new offenses or tricks on defense. You block and you tackle better than the team you're playing, you win. This year's Mentor of the Month interviews will review business fundamentals. They are the blocking and tackling of business success. Please enjoy now this Mentor of the Month presentation. Welcome to the Crown Council Mentor of the Month program. This is Steve Anderson. Uh, for the last 23 years, our mentor this month has spent her career specializing in the lending needs of dentists, having designed and implemented thousands of plans to fit dentists' varying bank needs from real estate and construction loans to equipment, lines of credit, and refinancing student loans. So she has seen and tackled just about every type of dental financing need. For the last 11 years, she has been the market president in dental professional and executive lending at T-Bank, a specialty bank with the focus of lending needs of dental and medical professionals. We welcome her years of experience today and wisdom as she shares her thoughts on this topic, what every dentist needs to know about practice debt how much, how long, and whether or not to do it. So with that, we welcome Audrey Wendell as our Crown Council Mentor of the Month. So Audrey, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So if there's anyone who can make money interesting, it's you. That's it, so, they call me the money lady here. Uh, and, and knowing that uh, our audience is everything from seasoned dentists that have been in it for an entire career, as well as those just coming out of dental school. You have a very broad audience here uh, yeah. with a lot of different uh, lending needs. Uh, we're in yeah. a very interesting lending market. <clears throat> and so yeah. a lot of questions that come up on, you know, should I, shouldn't I, how should I do it? So we're eager to hear what you have to say today. Okay. Well, great. So um, one of the first areas is um, we discussed before is uh, when to borrow. So, um, and there's, there are different, I call them uh, life events that happen at a dental practice. So um, initially, of course, they would start by buy in to a practice once they've associated, hopefully if they've associated for a little while. So they're gonna have just general capital costs of you know, equipment purchases, expansion, um, leasing a space. Um, and so there's, there's some areas that, you know, just having the experience that we have that, that we kind of stay away from and those that we go towards. So, you know, areas that we might want to veer away from with a newer doctor is some of them want to buy and um, own a building right away. So that's an area that we would usually try and counsel them and say, all right, let's, let's, let's take some, some steps here and trying to get you most successful or put you in the best position to be successful. So they might you know, buy equipment, we're looking at building out a certain amount of operatories. Um, and when they build out operatories, usually what we'll see is they'll build out four or five, six operatories that only equip you know, maybe two or three while they're ramping up you know, their dental practices. So um, that's one area that we see uh, a need. Of course, then there's experienced doctors that are moving, expanding, growing, improving the practice. Uh, marketing, uh, completely shifting their marketing, um, adding another doctor in their practice. So we've seen that area. So that's kind of that middle ground area. Then you have doctors that are preparing for sale down the road. They, they see that, okay, I'm not going to do this alone. I might have a doctor buy in or doctor buy me out. How do I best position my practice um, to, for sale? And that might be okay, doc, you've had the same equipment for 20 something years. Might be time to you know, consult with one of your dental equipment specialists and get out there and, and acquire some new equipment or just do some sprucing up and, and um, clean up their offices a little bit. Got it. So that's one area. Um, and then there's, you know, when we get to the practice transition, sometimes we're seeing more and more of these doctors that are buying in. Um, they, they, they come in at a certain percent, maybe a smaller percentage, doesn't hit them as hard as, as buying a brand new, you know, buying a, a practice and having to take on a million dollar loan right away. 
Um, and those are very successful. Those are the ones we find to be the easiest in terms of banking because we understand how that transition works. It's cash flow driven. They're buying a book of business that's already flowing, but they're not having the doctor walk away right away. So, so in, those, um, in those situations where you're going to have <clears throat> maybe a doctor who's selling part of the practice to maybe what is then an associate is going to become a partner, do you as a bank have requirements in terms of how the, the uh, initial, the primary owner doctor, how long he or she has to stay? Do you have any requirements around that or is, do you look at it just solely on the new partner who's buying in? Okay, so that's a great question because there, there's a couple ways that that happens. So usually the most successful practices that we've seen that have transitioned a, a buyer or a partner into the practice, they've associated for a certain period of time and then they buy in maybe 30, 40, 50% and the seller stays on. Um, then over time, they're able to bring in an associate and that associate comes in and is employed in the practice and might take on some of the seller, selling doctor's um, production. And then as the seller exits the practice, now you have a new potential buyer coming into that practice. So that's, that's what we've seen to be the most successful. Now we also have walk away. And that's, I think, maybe what you're referring to, which is a doctor coming into a practice, maybe associates for a period of time, but then they want to sell. They want to get out of their practice. And we usually like to see a six to 12 month um, commitment from the seller to assist the buyer just in case you have a little attrition or you have some issues in the practice, it's just, it's why, you know, we, it's wise for the seller or for the um, buyer to, to have that help from the seller um, as they're transitioning the patients, the staff um, into the practice. So as a bank, it helps reduce the risk if we can keep that seller involved. Um, so you take those on a case by case basis, I'm sure, based on exactly. what. <clears throat> yeah, situation. exactly. And some doctors, if, if they move out of state and they come to a practice, it's going to be a little riskier than a doctor that's lived in the same area, knows everybody from church, school, activities, outside activities. It's a little different. So we might want the seller to stay on a little longer with, um, you know, the, the doctor that's coming in from out of state, for instance. Great practice for them, but longer transition. So on the, on the buy-in side, uh, there's, you know, a lot, of, a lot of chatter out there that a dentist coming straight out of school just can't get financing, that they got to they're going to have some years under the belt before a bank will even talk to them. So uh, clarify that for us in, in general terms. What, okay. what makes a good new dentist uh, for a bank to look at? Or are they just off the market for a couple years until they get some experience? Well, um, generally speaking, is a little different than what we do at our bank. But generally speaking, there are so many banks out there. There are several specialty banks. Um, and the specialty banks that um, understand dental, understand that the, the success rate of dentists is so high, they are the best credit risks. I mean, I'm, maybe one or two industries might be above them, but the credit risk is, is really good. And so positioning yourself out of school, um, our bank, I know, likes to see that, okay, first of all, you graduated, you have a few hundred thousand dollars worth of student debt, right? So right. do you even like dental? I mean, if you haven't had any kind of associateship, how do you know if you even like looking in somebody's mouth and doing the dentistry? Is it going to so stick? Yeah. That's, that's, that's a reality. So um, we like to see that they've been um, out of school and associated in a practice. Um, and there are some that basically the day they come out of school, they can go ahead and, and, and borrow money. Uh, but again, is it the right thing to do? That's just each doctor. Um, I mean, each, some of them have residencies that they go through, so they've already been in a practice. So they, they get it a little bit better. They understand that, yes, this is what they want to do. But from a lending standpoint, we do ask those questions, and we do want to see that they've associated for a period of time. Um, the one thing I would say um, that, that, you know, we understand there's going to be debt. So, so it's important for doctors not to be afraid that no bank's ever gonna lend me any money because I'm gonna have to pay off all my student debt. That, that, right. is, that is false. Um, it's all based on cash flow. Um, so if, if they're gonna be buying a practice, we're looking at the overall cash flow, and then we just basically swap out the seller's information with the buyer's information. So if the buyer has limited or low expenses, they're gonna plug in just fine. And the cash flow should be able to manage their yeah. lifestyle. We don't want them to have to completely up 
root their lifestyle in order to pay back their loan. So um, we tell them, don't be so afraid of having your student loans out there. Um, so, so we will tell them, don't worry about paying that off at this time. Let's, let's get your cash flow going. And then if they're starting a practice, they should have a, a, some sort of ramp up on their payment because when they're opening the doors, they're not going to make a $6,000 payment uh, the first month. So right. there's a ramping up and your monthly payments should reflect that. Um, and then we also, were, you know, we would like them to associate as well to have additional income, outside income, which is easy to do. Pick up a day or two at another office while they're building their own practice out. So, um, you, yeah. mentioned, you mentioned student debt. Yeah. Now you, because you mentioned this to me before, you'll refinance their student debt, which was like, I, yeah, that was, that was a news flash. Me, tell us about that. Yeah. Okay. So, student debt's a little tricky. Um, typically, out there, um, at, at our bank, if you're established and you have equity in your practice, meaning you have 15, 20 percent equity, uh, you know, you, you've got some, you've got some student debt out there. We can refinance it all for you. Simplify your life. Uh, that's something that we feel very strongly that we can help you with because our rates right now, even though they're increasing, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point today, um, <laughs> I know it's inevitable, but um, our rates um, today are, are lower than some of those student loans. I mean, some of these doctors have six, seven, eight student loans, all at varying interest rates, all at varying maturity dates. So when they come in and they, they say, I've got you know, six or seven student loans, I've got six or seven small equipment loans, I've got a large practice loan, what we've been able to do, especially this last year, is just consolidate it all, simplify their life, um, and then you know have a nice fixed 10-year term for them so they don't have to worry about a rising rate environment, and um, their monthly cash flow typically increases substantially. All right, so um, regardless of where I am in my practice life, if you are the financial doctor, and you're gonna, you are going to declare me fiscally fit, uh, meaning that when I come to you, you're gonna say you are in really good shape and uh, you'll be, you'll be, you're in good shape to go to a bank and have a serious discussion about getting financing versus somebody who is like, uh, you need to go to the ER. <laughs> because yeah. It just ain't gonna, you ain't running a marathon yet. So. Uh, I mean, this is basic for some people, but for others not. When, when you look at somebody who say, yeah, this is a good candidate for financing, general parameters. So general parameters for the repayment or general parameters of what a good borrower looks yeah, like? Yeah, for what a good, for what you would look at as being a, a good prospective borrower. Okay, so number one is credit. Um, credit is the only way a bank is able to establish character. Um, without knowing that person and, you know, checked in with the family history, you really don't know what, um, what someone's character is. And so banks rely on their credit report. Um, the other point to mention on the credit report is everyone is so caught up with what their FICO score is. Um, your FICO score is just one way of a bank knowing. I have some borrowers that just have maybe a little bit more debt, but they have a great cash flow, never missed a payment, that have lower credit scores than someone that only has one credit card. It, it, it's, yeah. it's some sort of strange algorithm. Uh, yeah. the one, what I look for, what our bank looks for, and most banks look for is credit history. So we, you know, the FICO score is one indicator, but one of many. I wanna know, okay, if you were late, when were you late, and why were you late? Sometimes we have circumstances, life circumstances. Um, you know, divorce situations or, you know, different things that could have happened in someone's life. Um, and if we can isolate it to a time frame and it's, and it's something we can prove, that's not going to help. That's not going to affect their lending today. If something happened three, four or five years ago. So credit is, is really a big concern for banks. So if they've got good credit, um, that's number one. And their cash flow levels are um, where they, they not only meet their monthly payment obligation, but they're paying their own personal debt. And they have just a little bit of room, which we, we consider a 25% margin of, of error. So meaning that if you borrow, if you have $100 and you have $100 worth of payments, you're break even, right? We just wanna make sure you have extra 25 bucks in your pocket. So that, 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 that is oversimplifying. <laughs> what we do in spreadsheets and underwriting and all that that's that's basically what we look for and we look for that consistently and most of the borrowers we see with dental 
are usually well above that. So, um, so that's always good. Our more established doctors also have a pension for when K to fall back on, but right. you know, banks can't touch that. All that goes back to, again, is character. Bank cannot, if something happens in the practice, we can't go after their 401k retirement. That's, that's, that's protected by law. So we look, we look for the cash flow of the practice, how have they manage their money, have they been able to put money away, and are they paying their credit? Or, or, you know, are they reflecting well in their credit report and making their payments to their debtors? Um, how important would you say, just in general, because uh, I know the way that T Bank operates, you guys really develop a personal relationship with your clients, which yeah. versus a bigger bank might be just going off of FICO scores and right. you know, you're accepted, you're rejected. How important is the relationship part in what you all do? Yeah, and that's the one, one area I take a lot of pride in with our bank, um, just being the size that we are and our specialty in the dental market is we're not looking at a scoring system. You're, you're a person and every person has a different story. And um, so if something might, if, if we've got you know, nine things that are working and one that's not, yeah. we're not gonna say, well, now you're outside mm -hmm. the box, you're done. Um, we can guide um, some of these clients. As a matter of fact, we just closed on a really large loan um, in January where the doctor had a story credit, um, very explainable. He bought, you know, bought, bought a practice and had a circumstance happen that was out of his control, but he immediately fixed it, got to the end of the problem and it reflected in his numbers, but how he bounced back um, and, and his, his show of character again by not missing a payment um, help, helped us rally the troops and we were able to get the loan done, but I told him exactly what he needed to do in order for us to be able to feel strongly about representing the loan yeah. to our to our loan committee. And he did exactly what we discussed with him, as opposed to us saying, you didn't fit this box, so guess what, we can't do your loan. And that makes me really happy. So, so and I have clients that are, you know, I've worked with at my previous bank that still call me and say, I can't believe you're still in dental doing this financing. I, are, are you still open? Can you do more for me? They call one phone number, they call me, um, whether their loan's booked or in process or approved or, you know, so it's, they're not punching in a number with their social security trying to figure out who, you know, who to talk to. Right. So that's the one area we feel is, is the handholding um, and, the, and the quick response. So, so in, it, even in today's banking environment where we've gone through, you know, several years of pretty, things got locked down pretty tight in terms of compliance and, all Absolutely. those things. Even today, you'd say, uh, in general, that a banking having a relationship with a bank that can look at you more, look, look at you beyond your FICO score and just the statistics that you can work with is pretty key. It is really key, and and just knowing that you've got someone that has the experience in the banking world and also in the dental world, that's that's where you know, again, we, we like to, to brag a little on, on those of us that are at the bank that have been in it for so long, because we know we need to protect our bank. We need to protect you as the borrower. Um, and it, that way we have it all up, um, you know, ready for them to see, okay, these are going to be the issues. <laughs> let's, let's get those out on the table. This is a regulatory issue. This is a personal issue. This is a credit issue. I like to uncover that right up front. So we know this is where we are and okay, this is where our challenge is. How do we get beyond this challenge? So we've been extremely creative that way. All right, so um, different scenario. I come to you now and you're looking at <clears throat> my circumstance, me as a person in the whole deal, and you're gonna say to me, you have no business even trying to get a loan right now, okay? So what That's are- That's the fun side of my job. Yeah, right, yeah. so give me the parameters for that. I mean, when you see certain things you're going, now. I mean, you okay. gotta go home and do your homework and get better. Before you okay. Well, in. you know, I, it's not it's not that uncommon. I mean, it's it's it does happen. Um, we're blessed to have really great clients and, and easy ones, but we do have some of those. And here, you know, here's an here's a circumstance. So we have someone that bought a practice uh, 13 months ago, and um, she wanted to refinance her loan. So she wants to refi it. And first of all, it was it was a riskier loan, so there was a higher interest rate, um, and so it's understandable she wants to refinance it. Well, 13 months does not have enough bearing for us as an owner of a practice that's a walk away sale. So what, what our advice to her is, 
continue to make your payments. I know it's a stretch, but you're going to have to feel a little pain first. And you unfortunately still have to pay that high interest rate, but there was a reason that bank charged you that. Um, you were a higher risk candidate. And gotcha. so we'll say if you reach these benchmarks over the next uh, nine, 10 months, we can consider your loan for you. Um, and just, you know, keep your credit, credit score clean. Do not go out and buy a house. Don't go out and upgrade your car. Um, we've had that happen before too. I mean, we've seen it all. And they come back and go, wait, hey, I thought you said we were going to lower no. my rate and my cash flow. Was I'm like, no. okay, well, that was before you bought an $80,000 car when you were driving a Honda before. So <laughs> that all has to be taken into account. But, but we'll give them that very specific advice. So the production numbers look good. You, you transition and there was a little bit of attrition when you when you when she changed over she did lose a little but that's not uncommon but she had to, to to just kind of even things out and then what is she planning to do to increase the practice i mean we were very specific with her, her with what she needed to do got it yeah. all right so on the flip side then when should i seriously consider refinancing where it would be in my best interest and a bank would would be interested in doing it uh, well a couple of different scenarios one is if you're if you feel like you've got loans all over the board all varying interest rates maturity dates on some some that mature down the road but they might be adjustable um, there are so many varying factors but today we are in a rising rate environment but we're still lower than some of the loans that are out there um, and you'd be amazed at just consolidating that debt and refinancing it over a 10 year fixed rate, how that improves your cash flow. Because at that point, you can take any additional cash that you have and put it in something that's going to grow for you, um, something that's going to have a greater return for you than uh, you know, trying to worry about paying 10 different bills at 10 different interest rates. Um, it simplifies and also improves your cash flow. So that's one scenario. Also, again, taking a look at your student loans. I mean, if, if you have student loans that are out there, it's not impossible to, to even just pay a portion of them. Not, you know, if you've got some that are lower, it's an opportunity for you to pay off some of the higher loans and use your biggest asset, which is not only just your home, but using your practice. Um, your practice is, is a big asset for these doctors. You might as well utilize and leverage it. Um, the other um, area that we're seeing a lot of, as a matter of fact, right now is we're the only bank that I know of, really. I, there might be others, but that I know of personally in dental that are doing cash out on real estate. Um, it's a great area because now you're talking a piece of collateral. You have an asset that um, doesn't have to do with patience and goodwill, and it's, it's an actual appraised asset for a bank. So a bank takes a lien on it. Um, we go up to 80% loan to value on a conventional loan. So you don't have to pay your SBA fees. And you know, we have, if you have a, 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 let's just say building that has a million dollar value, we'll go up to 800,000. Well, they might only owe three, $400,000 on it, um, but they are positioning themselves to have a buyer come into the practice down the road and buy into the equity. So the smaller the equity, the easier it is for a buyer to come in and buy into that equity. We're doing a ton of that right now. Also, they're just paying off their random personal debt that they have. They might have credit card debt. They might have, right. you know, just varying um, debts out there that they want to just take care of. And um, this way, it's, it's secured by a building, which is great for a bank. It's the lowest risk that we can have. So, um, um, Talk to me about term. Okay. When is that important? What do you recommend? So um, terms, they're, you know, in dental right now, you'll see that 10 years is pretty standard. Uh, okay. If you can do a five, seven year, that's great. The lower, the shorter the term, the better the interest rate. So if you do a five year fix, for instance, it's going to be 25 basis points to maybe even 50, depending on where you go, um, of a rate. Is that, that's going to make a difference. They're fully amortizing. Um, if you do a 10 year fixed rate, uh, that's pretty standard in terms of dental practices. What I try and stay away from are 15 year. I have got clients that were refinancing that started out in 15, with 15 year loans. If you have to qualify over a 15 year amortization, you might wanna rethink 
am I spending too much? Do I, why do I need to cash flow this for 15 years? Because they'll come to me three, four years in and go, I can't believe I still owe this much money. How is that even possible? Right. And my answer is simple. All that money for the first three years went to interest. Didn't go to principal. There's no, gotcha. it's, you know, or a majority of it is. So the longer the amortization, the less of the principal gets paid down. So they're a little sticker shocked by the time they get to that. Um, so with that also, uh, there's, you know, prepayment penalties and things like that that can be a factor. So um, when you, when they look at these loans, it's really important um, for people to see what they're getting upfront on a proposal so that they know they can read through it all and say, okay, this is what I'm getting. I know that I'm going to have a penalty and this is what the penalty is and penalties are varying as well. It can be no paying off at all for the first year, or it could be you're paying 5% of the balance down to 4%, 3%. So they have to have an understanding of that. And, and I've got clients, to be honest, Steve, that have just sent me and said, I know you guys, you're just a little higher on the rate, but can you just take a look at this proposal for me? Because something doesn't seem right. And I may not even get the loan, but I'm more than happy to do that. Um, and, and in the long term, it's, it's the relationship and that might come back to me down the road, but I'm always happy to do, a, you know, just a quick glance at their proposal for them because you know, they, they, they do them and that's, that's what they want to do and that's what they should be doing. Not worrying about, you know, reviewing these proposals and looking at every single detail and not understanding it. And so I'm happy to do that at any time. Uh, talk to me about, as we kind of wrap up here, um, combining the practice debt with real estate debt. If I own the building or want to own the building, do you, do you roll those up into one loan? Are they separate loans? What do you recommend? They're usually separated out unless you're doing an SBA loan. Um, and, and most of the clients that we see uh, are, are, there really wasn't a reason for them to go SBA because they're stronger candidates. They qualify conventionally. So you'll have a, a conventional loan for a building for 20 years and then a practice loan at 10 years. So what some of the banks will do is combine them and do a 15 year blended, um, which is okay, but if you ever want to borrow um, against your practice, you're handcuffed to that, to that loan because now that bank has a restriction on both your practice and on your um, building. Gotcha. So I mean, uh, that, that's, that keeps you from potentially borrowing and there, and there, there might be areas is where there might be times when you want to refi a piece of it or just your practice debt. Well, now you've got to separate them out and do the whole process all over again. If your building is separate, you always have options for your building, and then you always have options for your practice. And there's different tax benefits to having each as well. And um, typically, the real estate loans are done in a separate LLC, and their S corps are, um, are um, the uh, either the borrower or the guarantor on their loan for um, for the practice. Just gives you more options, in our opinion. Uh, biggest uh, missed opportunity that you see on a regular basis when you're talking to Dennis, and it's like, why didn't you think about doing this or financing that or taking advantage of this? What, where, are the, where do you think are the biggest blank spots? Well, I think uh, we kind of touched on it before, and that is just having an understanding of their their current debt. I mean, they just a lot a lot of them just don't realize until we dissect their financials and say we ask for a, a few different items, and one of them is a debt summary. And the debt summary is related to their personal or their to their practice debt, and they're just going, they're just going, they're 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 producing, and they're they know they're making their payments and everything's great, but as time has elapsed when you, we tab them, put pen to paper, and they look at their debt summaries, they go, whoa, I didn't know I was paying 7% on that equipment loan from right. four years ago. Time goes um, by. It's eye-opening. Um, and so we have just found, I mean, we have clients that, that, that call later and say, thank you so much. I, I didn't even realize it until I had my CPA remind me that you have all this debt out there that's you know, 6% here and 8% there, and you have a maturity date coming up. Did you know that you have a maturity date? So, so the biggest recommendation I have is for them to just look at what you have out there and make sure that you're, you have a grasp on the debt that you owe on right now, because you'd be amazed at ways that banks can help you with it and simplify your life. So at T-Bank as a Crown Council resource partner is you will look at anybody's uh, debt. I mean, you'll take a look at every, help them pull all that together. You'll look at it. 
absolutely. make recommendations, give them the benefit of your years of doing it, no charge. And absolutely. I'm, you can do something, you'll help them or make recommendations or whatever. So yep. um, would you uh, give everybody your contact information and we'll have this printed as well. But for those that sure. are listening, how do they find Audrey? Well, they can email me at awendel at tbank.com. And that's A-W-E-N-D-E-L at tbank.com. They can call me 972-720-9026. They can even call my cell phone 972-689-2400. I've had the same cell phone number since I've been in the state of Texas. I, love it. Um, I have no problem, um, even if they just want a bit of advice. I, 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 we do it all the time. It doesn't matter. You can even text me. Um, text Love me it. there is fine too. I'm, I'm a big texter. Good so um, those are different ways you can reach me. And if you have any questions or concerns or just want, like you said, I can do, uh, it costs you nothing to have us even do a full proposal on, on a loan. It costs them nothing to do that. So. Great. Audrey, thank you for being our, uh, our genius, very wise uh, mentor of the month this month. Appreciate uh, not only your sharing what you shared today about finance and banking, but also everything you do along the way as a Crown Council Research Partner to help everybody be more successful. So thanks for being our mentor of the month. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me.